Hello, my name is Hwan San Sinim, and this is Sun Meditation in English. So, are we all ready to practice Sun Meditation together? Good. The topic for today's uh, contemplation and meditation is the life of Sun Master Chan Gang. Sun Master Chan Gang was the teacher of my teacher, Sun Master Song Dam. Now, as I've mentioned previously on this program, uh, when I was a junior in college, I got it into my head that I wanted to meet uh, a truly enlightened master and learn meditation from him or her. And uh, in due course, I, I learned of the name of uh, Sun Master Songdam and arranged to stay uh, at his monastery, now my home temple, Yonghwasa in Incheon. Now my primary reason for wanting to meet a master and learn meditation was uh, because from a very young age, I had always been plagued by um, spiritual and existential questions uh, about the meaning of life, the nature of human existence, uh, what a human being is and can possibly become. But I also had other reasons for wanting to learn meditation. Uh, at the time, uh, as a student, my dream was to become a writer. Uh, I wanted to write novels and short stories and poetry and that kind of thing. And although I had received a fair amount of encouragement and praise from my instructors and professors, still in my own heart, I felt that my writing was um, shallow <clears throat> and unremarkable. And I thought that if I could learn meditation, I could access a deeper part of my heart and mind and give rise to a, a more authentic and powerful artistic expression. So that was my second reason for wanting to learn meditation. And I also had a third reason. And uh, the third reason was because I was born and raised in the United States. I was culturally and psycho psychologically American. I only spoke English. And yet nonetheless, I felt something that was missing in my life. And I, I wanted to connect with my ancestral homeland and uh, see what kind of cultural legacy, if any, was available to me. So I had these three things on my mind uh, when I applied to, uh, in a sense, applied to, to go to Yonghwasa. And after graduation, as I've mentioned before, I, I took a plane trip and arrived at Yonghwasa in the middle of winter. Now, I had been told a couple of things. Uh, first was that I could stay at, the, at Yonghwasa as a layman uh, and uh, that I could get a room there and, and participate in the community life. And the second thing that I was told was that Sun Master Songdam was fluent in English. And uh, as it turned out, none of these things were true. Uh, as I found out the day that I actually arrived, uh, they said, if you want to stay here, uh, you have to cut your hair and wear the robes of a monk, even though you don't really plan on becoming a uh, sinim. So I, I was already there. So I, I felt like, well, I can't turn back now. So I became a temporary monk in training, uh, which is called a hengja. So that was the first, the, the, the next thing that I learned, of course, was that Songdam Sinim does, is, is not fluent in English. He, he can read and write very well, and he knows a lot of English words, but in-depth dialogue and conversation uh, would, would be beyond us. So I, I realized that I, I would have to learn Korean uh, very quickly. And then the third thing that I realized or learned was that Sun Master Songdam doesn't actually live in Yongwasa. He only comes out there for the Dharma assemblies to give his Dharma speeches. So I would have to wait several weeks before being able to meet him. And I, I was put to work almost immediately uh, in the kitchen, which is where the hengjas work, uh, washing dishes and cleaning and helping to prepare meals and that kind of thing. And at the time, <clears throat> the thing that the Sinims were, were most concerned about was whether I would be able to uh, hear these uh, uh, audio taped Dharma speeches that were broadcast twice a day throughout the entire monastic compound of Yongwasa. So actually on the first day, uh, when, I, when I arrived at the Yongwasa office, the, the monk who met me, who is now uh, my older Dharma brother, he pulled out a, a cassette recorder. Uh, that, that's the technology that was available back then. And he, he popped in a cassette tape and started to play this Dharma speech. And what I heard was this old guy who was very wild and, and very free and spontaneous and improvisational. And you know, he was screaming and shouting like he was scolding someone 
or, or and then right away he switch and be kind of cooing in this very gentle sing-song rhythmical way that that actually reminded me of the way my mother used to hum when she when she worked at home and sometimes he would chant and sometimes he would even sing and it, it was really just the most amazing thing and uh, it, was, it was it was a masterful vocal performance even though I couldn't hear a word that was being said but even more, more amazing or, or, or more impressive than that was something in the quality of his voice. I had the sense that, that he was uh, you know, completely sincere and authentic and earnest and honest. He wasn't trying to pretend to be better than he really was. Uh, he wasn't vain. He wasn't embarrassed about anything. There seemed to be no shame. He could just show himself as he really was, and it seemed that he was speaking directly from his heart. And that, that really struck me. You know, I, I thought, you know, you, know, you know, I wish I could write this way, you know, speak directly from the heart. You know, I, I wish I could be this way. So the, the Sini, you know, he was watching me and he asked me, well, you know, can, can you understand what he's saying? And I said, no, no, I, I can't hear a word he's saying, but this is incredible. This is one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. Um, is this Songdam Sinim? And, and he said, no, 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 this, this isn't Songdam Sinim. This, this is Changgang Sinim. Songdam Sinim's teacher. I was like, oh, okay. Well, well can, then can I meet Changgang Sinim? And they were like, no, no, you can't. You know, he, he passed away. He, he died in 1975. I was like, oh, wow, you know, I, I really like to have met him. And the same says, yeah, yeah, we, we, we feel the same way too. I later learned that, that, that Sun Master Changgang was, is, is unique among modern Sun Masters. He had inherited, as an enlightened master, he had inherited sort of the Sun Buddhist tradition of Sun dialogue that, that many of us are familiar with. But uh, he had also uh, picked up much of the uh, native uh, vocal musical traditions of, of his home province, which was uh, Jalado. So he could sing uh, so-called Korean opera or pansori. He, he also knew folk songs, and he was also uh, deeply versed in the narrative storytelling traditions of his home region. And he brought it all into one whole uh, in, in his Dharma speeches. And his Dharma speeches were designed to convey, uh, you know, to express his enlightened human heart, and also to inspire the awakening of it in, in the listener. So uh, years later, many, many years later, uh, when I was, uh, by then I had become an attendant of Songdam Sinim, uh, I, I told him, I talked about my first impression of Sun Master Songdam, uh, Sun Master Changgang, and he said to me, you know, Sun Master Changgang has, has such spiritual power that even if you can't understand his words, you can still hear him. And I found that to be true. And the purpose of today's program now is to share um, this, this experience of Sun Master Changgang with the, with the larger world to tell of his life and, and what meaning it can hold for us. So why, why don't we enter into guided meditation? So once again, assume sun meditation posture. Look straight forward with a soft gaze. And now we'll enter preparation breathing. In preparation breathing, we inhale through the nose. So inhale together through the nose and fill your chest. Hold. 
and exhale through the mouth. Now we engage the Hwadu, I Mo Go, which as you recall means what is this? So inhale, hold, and then on the exhale, I Mo Go. As always, I will ask everyone here and our viewers at home to continue to meditate while we uh, contemplate the life of Sun Master Chang'an. So continue to inhale. Hold, and then exhale. <clears throat> Sun Master Changgang was born in 1898 to a family of small-time farmers in uh, a rural town in South Jeollado Province, which is the southern agricultural region of Korea. Uh, when he was seven, he lost his mother. And his father quickly remarried, and he was raised by a stepmother. And uh, he tells us that, that he, he didn't communicate that well with his stepmother. She, she fed him and clothed him properly, but it sounds like that they didn't really understand each other, and they couldn't get into a mother-child relationship, uh, probably because uh, some master Cheonggang, Cheonggang Sinim, was, uh, was in a state of grieving. Uh, nonetheless, Chang Gang Sinim describes himself as a very playful, bright, mischievous little boy who liked to actually steal things. And he was always getting scolded by his stepmother, uh, and, uh, and he felt that he was uh, scolded too much. He was beaten very severely on a, on a regular basis. So he had this difficulty, and I also get the sense that, that he was mischievous, that he stole things because I think he needed attention. Uh, after the loss, such an early and tragic loss of his mother. Another difficulty in his life was that uh, even at a very young age, he began to realize how intelligent he was, and he wanted to feed his hungry mind, but his stepmother was not interested in educating him. So he begged her to send him to school, but I, she kept him at home probably to work on chores in, in a busy farming family. And so he was sad and lonely at the same time as he was playing around. And um, he had this kind of irrepressible personality. So ultimately, he actually taught himself how to read and write. Now, there are people in history who have done that. But nonetheless, I think that's kind of a remarkable achievement for a child. Uh, when you think about it, if there's no one standing next to you telling you that these circles and lines on a page mean this sound, in the language that you hear around you and in the language that you speak, if no one points out that connection, that's a hard connection to make, to go from these visual signs and symbols to what you're hearing through your ears, to make that connection. But somehow he did it. And I, I, think, I think he was able to do it because he was naturally very brilliant. So he did, it, he did manage to learn how to read and write at a rudimentary level. But, uh, but he, in his lifetime, he, he never achieved a high level of education. This was something that he always rued and, 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 and was sad about. Uh, he had a brother. His, his, his uh, father and stepmother had a child together. So he had a younger half-brother named Won Myung uh, when he was nine years old. And they lived together as a family. And uh, it, it sounds like Chang Gang Sim was having a very hard time in his heart. Uh, growing up as a child, because he tells us that when he was 11 years old, he went to a nearby waterfall, climbed up to the top, and uh, was very seriously considering killing himself. Uh, he felt that, that if he died, he could rejoin his mother. So he tells us that he stood at the edge of the waterfall, and, and he called out to his mother. You know, he said, Mommy, you know, when you had to go, couldn't you have taken me as well? But he, he couldn't get himself to jump, so he returned home and he lived with his family. When he was 14, he lost his father. His father died. And his stepmother ran away to remarry, to marry someone else, leaving him and his half-brother Won Myung at home. So their father's property was taken over by some distant relatives who came in to live with them. And at that time, at that point, Chang Gang Sinim's life became more of a nightmare. Uh, he and his younger brother, Won Myung, were treated with extreme neglect and, and even abuse. They were put into an unheated shed full of fleas and lice. 
where they were just tortured by the fleas and lice all night long. Uh, they were not fed properly, they were not clothed properly, they were not educated. And on top of that, they were beaten regularly, not only by the adults, but by their older cousins, who were supposed to be their playmates. So after almost two years of this, uh, Chung Gang Sim couldn't take it anymore. So he took his, his brother, Won Myung, and they ran away from home. Uh, they literally went out into the world with literally nothing but the clothes on their back, nothing to eat, and they just started walking. And they walked for miles and miles and miles, and, they, and what they did was Chung Gang Sim went to look for his stepmother's older sister, hoping to be taken in. But as soon as uh, the two brothers got there, the, uh, the sister ran out and just kind of screamed at them and very harshly rejected them. Didn't even give them a meal, didn't even let them sleep over, just sent them out on, sent them packing on the road again. So Jung Gang Sinim and, and Won Myung went walking and walking again for mile after mile. And this time they went to look for their father's oldest sister, again hoping to be taken in. And again, the result was the same. Uh, they, were, they were kicked out right away, and, and sort of the, the, the aunt came out screaming and, uh, and sent them off. So again, they were, you know, they were alone and lost in the world. So this time, Chung Gang Sim set off on the road again, taking his brother in tow. And this time, they went and found the stepmother who had abandoned them. And when they found her, you know, with her new husband in her new house, Chung Gang Sinim committed um, his brother back to her because she, he was her, her biological son. And then Chung Gang Sinim turned around and left again. And at this time it was autumn, winter was approaching, and he tells us that he wandered around, this little boy, um, you know, 13, 14 years old, he was wandering around looking for a place to stay, looking for a place to stay and, and trying to find a way to live in the world. And after wandering around for a while, he found himself a job as a kind of apprentice at a bellows furnace making brassware in a kind of a social welfare charity center that gave housing to vagrants and homeless people. So what he did was he worked this bellows furnace to make uh, brass dishes and bowls and cups and that kind of thing. And he, tell us, he tells us that, that at that time people recognized his brilliance. He learned it very, very quickly. And in a very short while, he became the, the best one in that, in that, in that sort of uh, brassware production facility, which was actually just a, a, a little group of furnaces. And he could make uh, brassware of better quality in a shorter amount of time than anyone else. So they, they were very impressed by him, and they wanted to, to, to keep him. But he only stayed on for a few months. And in the following spring, he took the money that he had gathered, and he returned to his hometown. And he paid for, he arranged to pay for a memorial service for his recently departed father. And he tells us that he was, uh, he was very proud that he was able to do that. They had treated him like this, you know, lost, unworthy tramp. And for him to come back with money in his pocket and a new suit and to be able to show to them, to them that he was a man of ability who could make his way in the world meant a lot to him. And to be able to honor his, his father through this memorial service. So he did that, and then he left, he left his town again. And this time he decided to get work as a street vendor. Now, uh, a street vendor in Korea at that time, at the dawn of the 20th century, was considered extremely lowly work. It was like one cut above being a thief or a con artist. Uh, the street vendors of that time were known to sell deficient products. They were known to deceive their customers. And, and Chung Gang Sim tells us that you know, because he was so clever, he, he even at, at a very young age, he had this remarkable gift of communication to be able to persuade people or out-argue them. So he figured he could get away with it, that he was clever enough and persuasive enough to make his living as a street vendor. But uh, there was a Sinim that he knew named Pyonwar Sinim. And this Sinim saw him about to become a street vendor, and, and he, he went up to him, he went up to Chung Gang Sim, he said, you know, you can't do this. You know, you can't be a street vendor. That's that's no way for a person to live. And then Chang Gang Sim said, "Well, you know, what else can I do?" And uh, Pianwa Sim said, "You you can become a sinim. That's a decent and worthy way to live." And Chang Gang Sim had actually thought of this when he had left home. This is something that he had already wanted to do, but a uh, a laborer, that, an, an adult laborer that he met, told him that that his, his social station was too lowly. 
that you had to have a higher position in society to become a sinim. So he thought that, that it was unavailable to him. So he asked the sinim, he says, you know, you can really do this for me. I, I can really become a sinim. He says, yeah, 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 just come follow me. So uh, he followed Pyonho Sinim, and, and the sinim took him to a, uh, a temple called Kwanamsa. And for a brief period of time, Changgang Sinim began uh, his, a life as a monk in training, studying Buddhist scriptures and getting ready for a life as a sinim. But he was very turned off by the headmaster Sinim there, who was kind of, um, he wasn't adhering to the monastic principles and rules. He was going out at night and carousing, and, and Changgang Sinim was very unimpressed and very disappointed. And he actually wanted to live as a, as a true Sinim, so he left Kwanamsa. And by this time, he was 16 years old. And what he did was uh, he went over to Hainsa, and he ordained there. So why don't we take a break now, and when we get back, uh, we'll, we'll continue with the story of Changgang Sinim's life. And once again, I ask you to continue to meditate uh, as you listen to the story of this extraordinary master's life. So as I said, uh, Changgang Sim was 16 years old, and he had ordained at Hainsa, uh, one of the most respected and venerated monasteries in Korea. And for the first time, uh, probably in his life, he was living in a stable social environment, in, in a stable community, and he was receiving an education. He and his fellow uh, novice monks, his hengjas, were learning the Buddhist scriptures. And he, he made friends with them. And he tells us that his personality at that time was, was the same as it, was, as it has always been. He was still playful and mischievous. He still liked to steal things. Uh, and he was still, uh, you know, very bright. And uh, so he was living there. And uh, one summer, this girl showed up. Uh, she came up from Busan, and her name was Sa Dogan. So Dogan. And she was a very interesting young woman. She was one of the first modern Korean women. She had uh, voluntarily rejected uh, conventional, traditional notions of Korean womanhood. And she, was, uh, she, was, she wanted to be a modern woman and live in a more liberal way. And so she wore Western clothes. She wore European shoes. Uh, she, she wore her hair in a, Europe, in a, in a West, modern Western style. And she liked to drink uh, with, with, uh, with the boys, uh, with the sinims. She liked to go out drinking with them. And to them, to, to these monks and, and lay people in this secluded monastic community, it was like she was an alien that had stepped off of a UFO. Everyone was staring at her, her hair, her clothes, the way she talked, the way she walked, you know, the way she addressed everyone. So everyone was very kind of fascinated with her. And, and they paid her a lot of attention. Now. <clears throat> Changgang Sinim had a friend, a close friend, and his friend's name was Kim Pongyun, Pongyun. And Pongyun was considered sort of the brightest and the most handsome of all the, the young monks, the one that had the brightest future. And uh, as it turns out, uh, uh, Pongyun and Dogan, uh, their eyes met, and, and, and they struck up a special kind of friendship. There seemed to be an attraction there and he would show her around their monastery. And there was a lot of idle gossip going around, but it wasn't malicious. Um, you know, it was a, there was a, 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 a feeling of a close-knit community, everyone knew each other, and the lines between the monastic world and the secular world were not as sharply delineated back then. So people saw this, this young woman with this young monk, uh, you know, sort of drawn to each other, and they kind of say, ah, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe they'll get married, you know, maybe they'll get married and have a family together, and, and that, that would be kind of nice. So the summer wore on, and, and you know, people gossiped, and this, this kind of thing went along. And one night, uh, Dogan, the, the girl, went out drinking, uh, which, as I said, she liked to do, and while she was gone in the middle of the night, uh, Pong Yun sneaked into her room and he hid under her blankets, uh, thinking that he'd wait for her. Uh, and while he was waiting for her, he fell asleep. And in the middle of the night, she comes back, 
you know, flushed, a little drunk. She walks into her room and she sees a stranger under the blankets and she gives, you know, she, she screams out, you know, she's totally surprised. And her scream startles him awake. He sits upright and the most inexplicable thing happens. He has a complete mental breakdown. He completely loses his mind. He starts to babble. He starts to act very wild, violently at times, breaking things, running around. And all of a sudden, you know, it's a, it's a complete nightmare. And, uh, and, you know, what had turned out, what had begun as a source of idle gossip, you know, maybe they like each other, maybe they'll get married, was now an outright scandal. You know, the, now they were saying this young girl came up from, you know, this strange young girl came up and she made this monk crazy. So Dogan had to go back to Busan and uh, the, the monks at Hainsa were now stuck with a full-blown medical problem. Uh, so they tried to treat Bong Yun with uh, the therapies that were available at the time, which was, uh, you know, basically acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine. None of it worked. He was getting sicker and sicker. Uh, more and more delusional, more and more wild. They didn't know what to do with him. And this was just a different time in Korean history, a different time in the history of the world. They didn't have modern medical facilities or, or a modern medical perspective on things. They only knew what they knew. And the only thing that they knew to do was to tie this poor boy to a tree in the middle of the courtyard. And every day, Chang Gang Sim came out and, and to look at his friend tied to a tree. And every day, this poor boy, Bong Yun, grew sicker and sicker. He wouldn't eat, he wouldn't sleep. He grew weaker and weaker, and it was clear that he was dying. And Jung Gang Sinim watched his dear friend die right in front of his eyes, day after day after day. And this had a, a profound effect on Jung Gang Sinim. He Il 
시 읽기 시 환이면 지요 시작 기둥한 거. So he was profoundly shocked. And the monks of Hainsa took the body of this poor boy up into the mountains and they performed a cremation ceremony for him. And Chang Gang Sim tells us that he watched the ashes of the smoke that was once the body of his friend swirl up into the air in like a whirlwind. And a Sinim at the time, the, the headmaster, his name was Kim Unge Sinim, gave a Dharma speech at the conclusion of the cremation uh, ceremony. And Jung Gang Sim tells us that when he heard the gata, or Buddhist verse, that concluded the speech, at that time he experienced a sudden aspiration to gain enlightenment. So Jung Gang Sim heard this, and now he knew he wanted to meditate. He wanted to meditate, gain enlightenment, and free himself from the suffering of birth and death. And he begged the elders in his monastery to give him permission to go to a meditation monastery. But they wouldn't let him because he was too young and he hadn't completed his studies. But he begged them and begged them and begged them and finally they let him go. So at the age of 19, he, uh, he was admitted into Chikchisa Meditation Monastery, which also is a very venerated mon uh, meditation monastery. And uh, what we have to understand here is that, that Chang Gang Sneem was experiencing a heightened spiritual crisis he had felt the impermanence of human existence, the impermanence of all things, and this had pushed him into a full-blown spiritual crisis. He was not in a normal frame of mind. So when he went to Chikchisa, he immediately set to practice, and his level of practice was very intense. He tells us that he would only eat a few mouthfuls for breakfast and then just meditate all the way through without moving until lunchtime. Then he would eat a few mouthfuls for lunch and then meditate again all the way to dinner. He would eat a little bit for dinner and then meditate again deep into the night. So he meditated in this incredibly intense, frenzied way. And initially, the community of monks and lay people around him were skeptical about him. They were, they were a little bit cynical. They thought, oh, this, this little kid's come here, he's showing off. He's going to wear himself out. He's going to get sick. But Chang Gang Sim just kept at it day after day after day without, without wavering. And he won their respect. They began to think, oh, this, this is not a normal child. This is not a normal kid. There's something about him. We need to support his practice. So he was, he was practicing very, very strongly like that. But the thing was, he had never been formally trained in meditation. Uh, so he didn't know how to do the breathing. He only knew what he had briefly read in his brief education. So when he held his hwadu, he held it up here in his head, instead of down here in his dantian, in his lower belly. And what happened was, now this, this, is, uh, this is according to traditional Asian uh, notions of biology, but what happened was he disrupted the flow of energy through his body and, and, uh, and he got sick in an ailment which is called in Korean sanggi. Uh, and translated in, in, into English, that means elevated chi, chi, the, our, our vital energy. And what that means is there's an overaccumulation of chi or vital energy in the head. And that gives rise to some really awful symptoms. Uh, even mild cases of sanggi, you can have uh, you know, really bad headaches and your, your head throbs and your face turns red and you get bloodshot. But because Chang Gang Sinim had such a fiery personality and because he was in such a heightened state of spiritual ardor, his level of sanggi was life-threatening. He began to bleed torrentially from his nose. I mean, just poured out. And when he blocked up his nose, he would bleed out of his mouth. So he was bleeding through his nose and his mouth day after day, and people around him were starting to think, this kid's going to die. And, uh, but, but he wouldn't leave. He, he, he held on, and he tells us that after a while, there was, nothing, there was no more blood left to bleed. His face had turned completely white. He was like a walking corpse. You know, people were thinking he was going you know, to keel over any second. Uh, he would just bleed a little bit now but he still kept practicing. And um, he finished out the, uh, the meditation season. And uh, after, after he finished out the season, he went down to a temple called Pomosa, and he stayed there for a while. And he was at this point very worried that he was gonna die, but, but also he was intent on gaining enlightenment. 
So he stayed there for a while, and then he recalled a dream that he had uh, when he was at Chikchisa. In the dream, he heard a gunshot coming from the west. So he took that to mean that he should go find Mangong Sinim, who was one of the most celebrated and illustrious sun masters of his time. Mangong Sinim was living at a place called Podoksa. So he got up and he went to Podoksa. And uh, he went over there and uh, he tried to live with them and participate in the community activity, but he found that he was just really, really very weak now. So he just kind of hung on and um, uh, you know, time passed and he managed to stay for probably five or six months. And he, he, finished, out the, uh, he finished out the summer retreat. And, and then after that, he went by himself on the road. And um, he was wandering, as, as meditation monks do in the, in the autumn and spring, wandering along through the mountains, he tells us. And as he was walking along a mountain ridge, he was pondering the Sun Buddhist teachings that he had learned. And out of nowhere, as he pondered these teachings, suddenly he experienced great spiritual awakening. He experienced enlightenment. And he, and he was completely immersed in, in the bliss and vitality of enlightenment. And, and it completely woke him up. And he decided then that he would have to go to Teansa, another temple in that area. So he walked toward Teansa and he reached Teansa by nightfall. And he went into the Bell Pavilion. And he stayed up all night, he tells us, in the Bell Pavilion, kind of intoxicated by this heightened spiritual state of his enlightenment. And in the course of the night, uh, he composed his enlightenment verse. Now the enlightenment verse is a part of Sun Buddhist tradition. Traditionally in Sun Buddhism, a disciple practices under a master. And when the disciple experiences enlightenment, uh, he is tested by the master through what's called sun uh, question and answer, a kind of dharma dialogue, where the hwadus, various kongans, are, are given to the disciple and the disciple has to answer them. And if he answers all, all, the, uh, all the Kongan successfully, then he is asked to compose a, uh, an enlightenment verse. So Sun Master Cheonggang was very, very proud of this enlightenment verse that he composed because you have to remember his education was very inadequate. And yet, in his enlightenment, somehow he managed to compose this very elegant, beautiful uh, poem in classical Chinese. So uh, in time, this, his enlightenment verse became uh, very well respected within Sun Buddhism as, as really, as really a, a, a shining example of this, this type of, of spiritual art. So I, I will now read to you uh, in English the translation of his enlightenment verse. <clears throat> Last night, moonlight filled the pavilion. Outside the window, a reed flower autumn. The Buddhas and the ancestral masters have lost their bodies and their lives. Flowing water is coming past the bridge. So with the composition of this enlightenment verse, Sun Master Changgang successfully attained enlightenment against all odds with almost no help, almost moving by himself. This is almost unprecedented in Buddhist history. And in fact, most masters say that this is impossible. And his age at the time of his enlightenment was 23, the age that most of us are when we just graduate college. Today's program is actually uh, the first part of a special two-part program uh, dedicated to, uh, to sharing the life of Cheonggang Sinim with a modern international audience and also to discussing uh, the significance or meaning of this life to, to us who live in the modern world. So in our next episode, uh, we'll talk about, we'll contemplate uh, what meaning and significance his life, the way he lived, the way he practiced, can have for us who live here in the 21st century. So I want to thank you all very much for participating uh, in today's program. This, this program, this particular program, has great personal meaning for me uh, because it's, it's the first time I'm able to convey uh, the teachings of this spiritual master who I really, really wanted to meet. And, and I'm just very grateful to be able to convey it today in English. So I will once again thank all of you who participated here and thank all of you viewers at home for, for participating. And I ask you to join us again in our next episode when we continue to follow the life of Sun Master Changgang. Okay? 
So I will conclude again with our customary Buddhist greeting. May we all attain the Buddha. An ogo, kyungiga, kuman, kumu, mun, nun, 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 자기야 어월만누다 창회 은노와주다 불조 상신명이요 유수 후가결연이란 벌러 듣지 마라 무식했네라 긁진 걸봐 강사도 못 있으신 게 응? 강사 지견을 붙여보란 말이야 Thank you.